create web pages that have text, that have different sections. We can create links to other pages, whether they be our own or whether they be somewhere else on the internet. We've started to style the pages and we can put images on our pages. So we've gone quite a ways from the first class to where we could just maybe put some text and headlines and things like that on the, uh, on the page. Um, for the most uh, part, for the rest of the semester, our focus is going to be simply adding to these things and augmenting them. CSS and HTML are two big concepts. Um, the way tags work, the way CSS works, and we're really just going to expand on those. So make sure you understand the basics of them and we're going to extend them uh, further. What I'd like to do today is talk about a couple things regarding CSS. Most notably, the ability to put the CSS code in a separate file. And the advantage of that is when you put the CSS code in a separate file, what you can do is you can then link to that CSS code from a bunch of different HTML pages. And that way, you get a similar look throughout all your pages. All right. So I'm going to start out with the example that we had last time, uh, the Abraham Lincoln example. I'm going to add maybe another page, uh, another page or two to it, and we'll we'll do some CSS styling with that. As we do more CSS stuff, we'll also learn some more CSS techniques. In other words, we cover just the very basics of changing the color of the page. We'll look at changing some other attributes of the page as well. In addition, we'll look at some other selectors. Um, we used HTML tags as selectors. We'll use some other things as selectors. Um, and we'll grow from there. At any rate, here's the example that we had last time. All right. Page, if we were to look at the HTML, I put in a folder, I put my two files the image file and the web page. I'm going to go and make sure that I can see the file extension for those files so I know exactly what to call them. So we have Lincoln.html and Lincoln.png. Um, a few students have questions um, about, the, they'll say something like I've uploaded it and then when I download it I can't see the image or whatever. Keep in mind that when you're done with this and you compress the file, send to a compressed folder. If you were to upload this and then download it again and look at it, if you went in here and tried to view the web page, you won't be able to see the image. And the reason for that is they call it a zip folder, but it's not really a zip. It's not really a folder. All right. It's a bunch of files that get sort of smashed together into one file. And therefore, you can't really see the individual files and you can't point to the individual files from each other. So in order to be able to view it once that you have uh, zipped it up, you need to go and extract the files again. So you can click extract. You can send the files. I'm going to put them somewhere else. I'm going to put them in the documents folder because I already have a copy on the desktop. Oops. So then I expanded it to the Documents folder, and then I can see the web page with, with that in there. So don't be, uh, or, or rather be aware of that as you are working on this, if you happen to upload it, that the zip file isn't really um, or I'm sorry, the zip folder is not really a folder. It's really just all those files sort of smashed together and put in into one file, like an envelope. In order to really use those files, you sort of have to extract them again. All right. So what I'm going to do now is let's take a look at what we had here. Go to Notepad and open my file.
Someone did mention, I got an email from someone, that when you save the file, you should actually choose UTF-8. They mentioned that in the textbook, and I've neglected that in class. Strictly speaking, that is correct. Uh, for what we've been doing so far, it shouldn't really make much of a difference, but that was a point well taken. That was something that was mentioned in the book. Um, but at any rate, All right, here's our page from before. And if we look here, notice we have the standard sections of the page. Again, these should be on all of your pages, the doc type, the HTML tag, and the ending HTML tag, the head tag, and the end head tag, the title tag, the body tag, and body tag. Within your body, then, you should have some of these different, what they call in the textbook, structural tags. Something to show the different sections of your pages, the nav section, the header section, articles, asides, uh, and so on. So. Your page really could, should consist of a series of those. And then within those, you'll have all the stuff that, that we had. Um, if we look here, we have the image, which was the tag that we talked about last time, which again, image has two attributes. One is the SRC attribute, and that indicates what file is going to be put in that image. And then finally, we have alternate text, which is used for people that are accessing it with screen readers or whatever. The image tag is an empty tag. That is, there really isn't a separate beginning and ending tag. It's sort of rolled into one. And the way you designate that is, instead of having the greater than sign at the end of the start tag, you have a slash greater than sign. All right. We do have some CSS here. We change the site um, text decoration to underline it. We've also made some changes to the block quote tag. What I'd like to do now, first of all, is to put this in its own file. Because I'm going to make other pages. And I want those pages to have the same look as this file. That's an important aspect of web design and web development is consistency in, in terms of your design. I think I talked about this before. In a sense, you're sort of educating people about how your page is going to be laid out by doing certain things. And it's not even like, how do I want to say, it's not even like it's a conscious thing. People just notice, oh, the navigation's always on the top. Oh, the links are always blue and underlined. Oh, the stuff that's in gray indicates a quote. You know, it's not like they think those things, they just notice those things, and instantly that communicates to the user something. All right? And therefore, it's, it's a great idea to have uh, your pages consistent. So, one way to make them consistent is to go and take this style code and put it in another file. Um, Remember, one of the, the guiding principles in all of any sort of software development, whether you're talking about web development or whether you're talking about more traditional programming, is to make it easy to change. Because you know that there's going to be a point in time when you want to change it. And you want to therefore make it as, as simple to change as possible. As simple to change will translate to taking the least amount of time, least prone to making mistakes doing it, and you'll be better off all the way. I'm going to draw a graph that is very famous in the world of, of all sorts of software development. And I would say it, it more than likely, well, I will say it does apply to web development as well as other forms of software development. And the graph looks like this. Um, let me draw it here. Again, this is meant to just sort of show you the, the give an overview of, of how these two variables behave. And what that is, is that this shows the cost of making a change in some software 
compared to the stage of the project in which we find it. In which we, we find the error and they make the, the change. And again, it doesn't even have to relate to error specifically. It could relate to just making changes for other reason. Now if you notice, this graph, it goes and it increases at an increasing rate. Which means that it doesn't increase like a straight line, a linear progression. This is closer to a geometric progression, for those of you that are fans of mathematics. All right. What this means is the later in a project that you find a problem, the more expensive it is to fix it. So, if me and you are, are talking about developing a website, and we're going back and forth and we're exchanging ideas, and one of us realizes that we forgot about something. That is, we're at the very early stages, the planning stages of a web development project. If we decide that we forgot something, it's not that costly to fix it. We just say, okay, well, that's another thing we have to do. If, however, that website is up and running, that we're far along the stage of the project, and the project is up and running and we find a problem, it's much more expensive to go back and correct it because there's stuff that we have to undo, there's new stuff that we have to do, and so on. It's much like if you were building a house. If you were building a house and you decided you want three bathrooms instead of four, all right, that would cost more money if you decided when you were planning it, when, you're, when the architect was sketching it out, if you decided you wanted an extra bathroom. Yeah, that would, that would cost a little bit more to go and change your plans. However, it's going to cost far more if you've already built the house and you have to start tearing down walls and running new pipe and all that sort of thing. All right. The upshoot of this is we're going to do two things. First of all, we're going to spend a lot of time planning our stuff before we actually code it and, and, uh, and, and release it. The other thing is we're going to apply as many good practices as we can to try to flatten out this curve. So in other words, if someone did a really sloppy job programming, the curve may go like this, where it really skyrockets. Whereas if someone did a really great job programming, the line may go a little less steep. All right. So all the things that we do that I say, this is a good practice to do this. The purpose of it is to sort of flatten out that curve and to make it so that it's not as costly as it could be if we make change. So with that in mind, we're going to take and we're going to go and we're going to put the CSS code in another file. So I want to go and cut this code out and I'm going to save that file for now. We'll come back to it in a minute. And I'm going to paste my CS code, CSS code in there. Now, when you put your CSS code in its own file, you don't need the style tag. So I'm going to get rid of the style tags. Oops. So my separate CSS file, if you put your CSS code in a separate file, you don't need the style tags. Remember, the style tags are simply there to tell the browser, hey, this code is HTML, this code is CSS. Well, if you're not combining it all in one file, you no longer need to do that. So we're going to put this in its own file. Then I'm going to go and save this. And I'm going to save it with a name. I'll call it style.css. Typically, you end CSS files in .css. You don't absolutely have to, but it's a good practice to do that. I'll go and save it. So now I have the separate style file that is style.css. I'm going to have to go and tell, and I put it in the wrong place. Where did I put it? Well, let's do a find.
Oh, it's in there. My mistake. I was looking, I think, at the at the zip file before. There you go. All right. I now have to tell the HTML file to use this style file. Well, how do I do that? Well, I put a link tag in there. Now, this is a case where it's a little unfortunate because we use the word link to mean a couple different things. In this case, when I say link to a CSS file, I mean this page is going to use that CSS file. It's not a link like the other kind of link where when you click on it, it goes to another file. All right. This is going to be in the head section. So it's another thing to put in our head section. And it looks like this. Link. Rel equals style sheet. Type equals text slash CSS. Those will always be the same. And then finally, href equals, and then we have the name of the style file. So in this case, I'm going to put this on a separate line because I can. And remember, there's no problem doing that. Style.css. And again, this like the image tag is also an empty tag, so I put a slash greater than sign. So now this code, this HTML page, points to that style file. And if I go and save this, and I call up the web page, I see sure enough it gets that style file. And in addition, then, I can make a second page if I want to. If I want to make a page about George Washington, let's say. All right, we'll just pretend I wrote a paragraph about Washington crossing the Delaware. And we'll pretend that I have a block quote of someone talking about this. So let's go and save this. And now, do you notice this has the same style as this? Because neither of them have the style code embedded in them. Both of them have a link to that separate style file. And that separate style file then is what has the style rules for that page. So I could go and change this. All right. Let's say, for example, I wanted to make um, the text on the page blue. All right. I could go into style, CSS, and say in the body, I want the color of the text to be blue. Right. 
And now the George Washington page is blue and also the Abraham Lincoln page has blue text. All right. Now I did this with just two pages, but there's no limit to how many pages you could do that for, right? I could have hundreds of pages, all of them pointing to the same CSS file. So if I simply make a change in one of them, it'll make the change in all the files. And that's a good thing because that will create consistency in your pages. All right? All your pages will have the same basic look and feel. All right? What I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a little navigation section here. All right, I'm going to add a navigation section to my, my page. Um, and so I'm going to link these two pages together. Now one thing that I'm a fan of and, and that I, I like to do a lot is I like to make my navigation look identical on, on every page. So I'm going to put a link in even though it's a link to itself. All right, so I'm going to go in here into the Lincoln page and I'm going to create a nav section here. And what is a navigation? A navigation really is a list of links. So I'm going to put an unordered list. Oops. And that list is going to contain a list of list items. And those list items are going to be links. So I'm going to create a link back to itself. And I'm going to create a, a link to the Washington page. Then I'm going to copy this nav section to the Washington page. So now when I go and view this, I have a link between the Lincoln and Washington pages. I can click on Lincoln, go to that, and I click on Washington and go to that. So even though the Lincoln page has a link back to itself and clicking it doesn't really do anything, I like the fact that if I look here, notice how it looks like that doesn't even change, right? That gives you sort of a very constant feel. And that, that feeling sort of anchors the user and lets them know, hey, the navigation's going to be here, all right? And, uh, you know, and you don't have to worry, you don't have to search around for it. You don't have to look for a particular link, right? So the pages will all sort of have an identical navigation. Yes? Are we going to learn how to like, put the navigation in one part and then... Yeah. Uh, ex yeah, yeah, we will. We'll, we'll cover that. Really, a, a big section uh, that will come up in a few weeks, we'll talk about CSS positioning. But um, if that's something that you all play with prior to that, we can, we can discuss that in lab. But uh, there's a lot you can do with CSS positioning. Really, what we're, gonna, what we're getting to here is we're getting to a page that we can do a lot of stuff with, but all our pages until we discuss CSS layout are going to be the sort of linear thing where there's a, the top thing, the second thing, the third thing just in a straight line. And until we get into CSS positioning, that's how the pages are going to look. But after we do that, then we can position things however we want to on the page. Okay, good question. What if I wanted uh, different colors for uh, the link. What if I wanted the Washington link to be one color and the Lincoln link to be another color? Now, I would suggest against that because that could be confusing to the user, all right, first of all. No, I mean like the, um, the, the body text. Okay, 
All right. Let, all right. Let's say. All right. So not the links, but the text on the page. All right. Fair enough. So let's say, for example, we wanted, say, this headline to be red on one page and blue on another. All right. Well, let's go into our style file, and I can do this. I can say h1 color red. Now what's this going to do? It's going to make all my H1s on any page red. So, yeah, I made those two red, but it also did it for the linked one as well. All right. Now the question is, is what if we wanted to make Lincoln's H1s blue, let's say, and Washington's H1s red? All right. What we need is we need a different sort of selector to fine tune and say, I don't want to make all H1s this color. I just want to make certain things this color. And we have a couple choices for that. We'll talk about one of them now, and we'll talk about another one of them later. All right? What we can do is we can assign a class to the elements. So what I can do is a class is a different sort of selector. An HTML tag is one selector, right? Well, we simply put in the tag and then we put in the attributes that that tag gets. If I start with a period and then give the class a name, I can go in and specify a different color rule. So I say now Lincoln color blue. Now, nothing's going to happen yet. I haven't done everything I needed to do. But if I go and save this, if I look, sure enough, no impact yet. But if I go into here and I put in class equals Lincoln, class equals Lincoln, then I can make Lincoln the exception to the rule. In other words, all H1s get red except for the ones that I assigned a different class to. And those get the different color. So I go here and save this. And now the text on Lincoln is blue, whereas the text on Washington is red. So to answer your question, the HTML tag is just one kind of selector. Generally speaking, you do want some level of consistency. You want things to look the same. You don't want things to look greatly different. But if you do, for whatever reason, you want to make things look a little different, maybe just for a little bit of visual variety, or maybe to show a certain kind of emphasis, or for whatever reason, one way that you can do that is you can do that by creating a class and using that class as a selector. Now notice, there is no HTML tag name, named Lincoln, right? And we designate that this is not an HTML tag by putting a dot in front of it, by putting a period in front of it. So I have dot Lincoln. And then the selector becomes a class name. So not, you know, unlike these, whereas anything that's an HTML tag of block quote, anything with an HTML tag of site, and so on down the line. Here we say anything that has a class of Lincoln gets that color. And so, if I, one second. So if I go in and put a class of Lincoln on certain attributes, then it gets that different coloration. Yes? Thank you. Yeah. So you have to go and assign the class. You know, the HTML tags automatically sort of get applied, right? Because this knows that this is a body tag. This knows that this is a block quote tag. But to, with a class, when you define a custom class, you have to go and assign that class to the things. Um, so what you're doing is essentially you're creating exceptions. Yes, I want all my H1 tags to look this way, except for a handful of them I want to look different for whatever reason. Now again, make sure you have a reason for doing it. You shouldn't do things just in an arbitrary way. Yes? Hmm? 
Okay, the question was, is when I specified a color for body, why does everything get that color? Well, it's because what does a body tag contain? The body tag contains all this stuff. All right, let's look at the HTML code. Here's the start body tag. That body tag contains the navigation, contains the header, contains the article, and there's where the body tag ends. So everything between the start and end body tag is part of the body. And therefore, that style rule applies to that. Okay? All right. Now, what more can we do with this style? We, you know, we can do as much as we want to. If we want our body to be, um, to use a, a, uh, a different font. We could say font-family. That's the attribute name for font. And then we can specify a list of fonts. So I can specify Arial, Helvetica, Sans Serif. Now if we go look at the page, notice we've changed the font. And we've changed the font on both of the pages. Let's look at this CSS for font a little closer. First of all, I put it on the body tag, so that means everything in the body tag gets this rule. So everything we've made having this font. I have font-family. That's the name of the attribute. And then I have a list of fonts. All right. Notice I have a list of three fonts. Arial is a font. Helvetica is a font. And sans serif is sort of a generic font. Why do I have a list of fonts instead of just one font? Why don't I just say, hey, I want the font to be Arial? Yes? Exactly. Uh, in order for a font to be displayed, it has to be on a particular machine. So I could be running a machine that doesn't have the font of Arial. And therefore, what it will do is it will go down and it will pick the next font, Helvetica. And it will go all the way down until it either hits the end of the list or it finds a font that it has. Normally, the last font on the list is the name of a generic font that any browser should have. This is just a generic sans serif font. Now, what is a serif? What does serif and sans serif mean? Any ideas? Yes. Yeah. Serif fonts have the little little tips. Tips is a good word for that. I was trying to think. I, I would probably have said has the little thingies on the end of the letters, but tips is probably a better a better uh, way to put it. So let's go. Let's let me let's just use Word to demonstrate fonts. I'm going to go to Times New Roman, which is a serif font. make a big one. There's the letter T. Notice that the T has kind of a little tip on the end of each letter. A little thingy sticking out here. If I go to Arial, Arial is a sans serif font. So notice there's no little thingy sticking off the end of the T. All right. Um, fonts like colors can sort of um, evoke um, sort of a feeling and, and can sort of give 
um, I don't know what to say, give, give uh, um, a, a bit of an atmosphere with that. All right? Typically, serif fonts sort of have that classic look to them. Whereas sans serif fonts have sort of a more modern look to them. I guess that's the way I would describe it. Now, CSS ought not be like an all-you-can-eat buffet where you can say, hey, look, I can change the font on every single HTML tag, so I'm going to go and do it. Right? Pick a couple of fonts and use that. Oftentimes what is done is serif fonts are used for like headlines because the, um, the serifs on larger letters sort of help with readability and do some things um, there. Whereas with smaller font types, sometimes the serifs sort of get in the way. So if we go to let's go to the Wall Street Journal website, we'll see what many sites do. Notice that the bigger things are in serif font. So notice, for example, this headline, Summer's Exit Cheers Markets. Notice there's a little thingy on the end of the S, on the end of the U, M, M, and so on. But if we look at the text of the article, the text of the article is uh, in sans serif because for smaller text, for like big chunks of text, sans serif is typically more readable. All right. Well, you do want to, well, well you can use your fonts to, to sort of uh, evoke a mood or uh, evoke a feeling. Um, you do ought to remember that being able to read the text is first and foremost the reason why you're using these fonts. So this is a case of where we have a very, very, very classic look on this page. All right. In fact, if you were to see the print version of the Wall Street Journal, it would look real similar to this and the, the mix of, or, or the kinds of fonts uh, being used. Contrast that with what you'll find on the Apple website. On the Apple website, again, notice all the fonts are sans serif. And that's readable as well. But it sort of gives a different feel to it. This doesn't have the classic feel. This has a very sleek, modern sort of feel to it. Again, a very subtle way that both these websites used fonts to sort of reinforce their image. All right? Apple site wouldn't look the same if you used a serif font, a Time, a time Soon Roman. It would not evoke the feel that they're going after. Uh, that is of Apple machines being high tech and sleek and modern. All right. By the same token, if the Wall Street Journal used the same sort of typography as the Apple site did, it would give a totally different feeling as well. It would not give that classic Wall Street, you know, businessman uh, sort of uh, feel to it. So, in the spirit of this, I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a couple different fonts. When I have a list of fonts like this? Yeah, it will go down and it will first look for Arial. If, it has a, if, if the machine has Arial, it will use that. If not, it will look for Helvetica. Put it, still put a semicolon on the end, yeah. It is forgiving if you don't put the semicolon on the end in, in many cases. Sans serif, there's a dash between this. Um, the reason I picked these in particular is that Arial is a font that's found on Windows machines. Helvetica is found on Macs. And generic sans serif would be any of the machines, whether they be a really, really old machine or some, you know, oddball machine to sort of slip through the cracks. 
So uh, I deliberately picked those fonts to try to cover that. If you look, you know, you can uh, Google and find some um, popular font combinations. Oh, this is the one I want. Ariel Helvetica sans serif, Ariel Black Gadget sans serif, Comic Sans, which you should never use, Cursive sans serif, Impact Charcoal sans serif, and so on down the line. And again, these are ones that are designed to be um, cross-platform capability, uh, uh, to give cross-platform capability. Now, I'm going to look at this resource. This is a beginner's guide to pairing fonts. That apparently killed my computer. Oh, there we go. This uses Futura and Rockwell. Let's go and try that. Let's make the body of the page be Futura. And let's make H1s have Rockwell and serif. Alright. So notice I used for my headings, I used Rockwell for the body of it. I used the sans serif font, which was, um, what did I use? Oh, Futura. So that's a nice combination. That, that goes together. Anything that you talk about, any, any styling element that you talk about, you definitely run the risk of overkill if you overuse it. All right? So whether you're talking about color or fonts or any sort of visual um, design consideration, um, you know, it, it would be like and again, maybe this is this is the, the, my own way I like to eat food, right? But it's like, you know, you don't want the spices to overpower the food, all right? You know, if you with the, with the right amount of spices, you accent the food. You don't want to overwhelm it, all right? So, I want to put just enough variety of the font so I sort of accent some things. This makes, this get, this makes the page look a little more interesting, right, than it did before. The headlines are in serif, so they sort of stand out a bit. And the text is sans serif, which makes it a little more readable. All right? But I didn't go crazy and make every single thing have a totally different font. All right? It's kind of like someone that yells all the time. Right? Someone that yells all the time, you can't tell when they're mad. Right? Because they're just yelling all the time. All right? As opposed to someone who's very soft-spoken. If they come in one day and yell, you're going to notice that. All right? Uh, sort of the same idea here. The things that you're going to use to try to emphasize or set apart different parts of the page, you don't want to overkill. You don't want to overuse. Because then it will not emphasize anything and it will not set apart anything. All right? So if you just use a few different fonts, maybe in this case I use two different fonts, that's probably enough for most of your purposes, then that's probably a good balance between variety and simplicity. All right. Similar thing for colors. If you remember the colors uh, generator that we looked at, it gave you five colors. 
All right? You might say five colors, you know, that's not that many. But when you consider you also have white and black in there, all right, plus any shade of gray that you want really is a neutral. It would, it would go with anything. That really gives you a lot of different colors that you could possibly use. And that is going to be more than enough colors uh, to use uh, with this. Questions about this? Now, one thing that we haven't talked about that we can do is we can actually use images to be a background for things. So, let's go in and let's Google I'm going to go and I'm going to save this image. Now I'm going to go into my CSS file. And I'm going to say body, background, But instead of putting in a color name like green or blue or red or whatever, I'm going to put in URL and I'm going to put in the name of the image, which if I remember right was flag.jpg. And if we look, then we get the flag as a background image. Now. What's wrong with this? Yeah, a good portion of the text you can't read because there's blue text on a different blue background. So what do you do then? Well, one thing you could do is don't use background images. Then you won't run into that risk. All right. But if you're careful, you can use background images and they can make the page look really good. All right. But you have to have precaution. Now, um, what I would suggest doing in this case, a couple things you could do. One thing you could do is you could actually fade the background image. Make it look a little bit like a watermark. So instead of being these bright red, white, and blue colors, it was a very subdued red, white, and blue. So through photo editing we could go and we could do that. The other thing we could do is we could put a background on these things. On the H1 and H2 and so on down the line. And that way, instead of being up against the image, it will be uh, against the background. We'll talk more about this next time. All right. This is sort of a bad example to, to end with because this didn't come out too effective. But if we're careful, we can actually achieve some really nice effects with this. And um, we'll, we'll, look at, we'll look at maybe doing a better job with this uh, on class on, uh, on uh, Wednesday. But I did want to introduce this to you. Any questions? All right, we'll see you over in lab.